This particular video is about how to use the ion beam on our Helios 5 UX system. So first thing you're going to want to do when you come in after you've logged into iLab is check to see whether or not the ion beam itself has been woken up. This basically means that the gallium source has been heated so that it can flow properly and have emission. So click in the ion beam window. You can tell it's active because the ion beam window data bar is now blue. And come over here to column and you'll see that the bar underneath beam on is green. This tells you that it has been woken up, that it is ready to go. If it was not, very simple, just come to system wake up, click on that and this bar would start out empty and then slowly fill up with red and then orange and then eventually turn green. In this case, it is green, so we're just going to continue. We're going to vent the system. Put your sample in. Pump the system. So hopefully you've already seen the basic SEM operation video, but if you have not, we are currently waiting for the chamber pressure down here in the lower left corner to reach five to the negative five millibar. And this will usually take about three to five minutes. So we come over to the SEM view, turn the beam on, Go to the nav cam view, choose our sample, which I believe is this one. Double click to go there. Image is paused, unpause, focus. Focus again. As in the prior video, we're not worrying about getting the image perfect because we're not at operating height yet. So we want to get it good so that our uh, working distance is fairly accurate. Then we're going to link, go over to navigation, take the Z to four millimeters. Always a good idea to keep your finger on the escape key just in case. Refocus. Relink. Go to four. Now this puts us pretty close to where we need to be. So what we're going to do now is since the purpose is to use the ion beam is that we want to tilt to the angle of the ion beam and on this instrument that is 52 degrees from the e-beam so choose a reference point because we want to have as good an overlap between the two as possible we're going to come over to navigation and we're going to make some incremental increase in this case i'm going to choose 13 millimeter or 13 degrees and you'll notice the image has moved some. And what that tells me is that I'm not exactly at eccentric. I'm close, but not quite there. And since eccentric is based off height, we're simply gonna come over here to stage Z and we are going to move the uh, sample up. If the image had moved up, I'd be moving the stage down. And now I can put in 26 and it should move less. And it did. So now we can go ahead and tell it to go to 52 degrees. And there's often a little bit of lateral drift don't worry about it too much. Beam shift is incredibly useful for taking care of this. Now we can use the ion beam. It is very important 
that before you ever open up the gun valve, the ion beam, that you check both your voltage and your beam current. For the vast majority of the work, uh, you are going to be running at 30 kV. This is the maximum for the ion beam. It's what it's most efficient at, what it's most of its alignments are done at. All right. The only time you're actually going to go to lower voltages is if you're dealing with something like doing a TEM specimen. Uh, so for general work, 30 kV. Now, the beam current is also incredibly important because the ion beam is always damaging your sample. Okay, the only question is how quickly it's damaging your sample. You've got these relatively large particles, these ions, uh, gallium ions to be specific, slamming into your sample at very high speeds and they are going to mill away material, uh, even if that's not your goal. So you have to choose a beam current appropriate to what you are attempting to accomplish. Basically, the lower the beam current, the slower you are uh, damaging your area, the more image you could do before causing uh, surface topography changes. But by the same token, if your goal is to mill away, then you need higher beam currents. So initially, at least, I'm more interested in just doing some basic imaging. So I'm going to go to 41 picoamps. This should give me a fairly decent signal level without it being uh, overly uh, damaging. Now, my beam is still not on, the gun valve is still closed. So I'm going to turn that on. And then note down here, you have an ion beam current display. Because what is happening right now is even though the ion beam is on, the gun valve is open, the beam is being redirected into a Faraday cup. And so it's actually capable of measuring the amount of current being created by the beam. So we told it 41 picoamps, it's running about 40 picoamps. This is fine. One thing to note about this, the ion beam current is controlled by a physical aperture. It's actually a strip that the ion beam streams through holes in it. What this means is, is as the ions go through this hole, they're slowly enlarging that hole. So over time, the ion beam current will climb as that hole gets larger and larger. The specification for this is plus or minus 10%. If you notice that there is a substantial overage, so instead of 40 picoamps, if I'm getting like 60 picoamps, then you definitely want to make sure to inform staff about it because this can have serious repercussions, not only in your milling, but also in any deposition that you do. My beam is on. I'm now going to take a snapshot. Snapshots are great for the ion beam because of the fact that it does a single pass only. Now, this a previous user here has set this up so that on snapshot, it will automatically give you the option of saving your image I don't particularly like this because I use snapshots a lot. So I'm going to cancel this and then I'm going to come up to scan preferences and then scanning for the ion beam down here. You'll see an icon that matches up that of the snapshot. And if you click on it, it says snapshot preset. And down here it says action save as I want no action apply. Okay. So now it will no longer try to save it whenever I take a snapshot. So one of the things you'll note is that the magnification between the two beams is very significantly different. If you like this, not a problem. I personally find it annoying. So I'm going to come over here, choose the electron beam as my primary, and I'm gonna say couple magnifications. And what this means is that if I come back over here and take a snapshot, the mag is now the same. So you'll notice there is a slight offset between the two images. First thing, always check. Come over here to beam shift. Zero them out. Make sure that you don't have something artificial in here. Snapshot. Snapshot. OK, they're still off. I can address this, the vertical component, I can easily address by simply coming back over here to 
uh, the stage Z again. Now, the thing to remember is that when you are adjusting position via uh, stage C, that you always use the beam that is not perpendicular to do the movement. And that the beam that is perpendicular is what you're gonna use as your reference. So in this case, we are perpendicular to the ion beam. So we're gonna use the ion beam as our reference position. So I'm simply going to double click in this corner here. I'm going to see what it looks like over here. So you'll notice that the reference position is high. So I want to move the stage down. And it only took like one click. And then as far as a little bit, you know, one micron worth of lateral offset, I can simply just use the beam shift to get rid of that. And there we go. We're looking at the same spot in both. Now that we have the positioning set up correctly, now we can actually do ion beam work. So what I'm simply going to do, I'm gonna zoom out a few top and move over to a corner here. And for doing ion beam work, most of what you're going to do is here under the patterning window. So you have a whole series of patterns that you can do. You can do squares or rectangles. You can do lines, circles. You can also do donuts if you do a circle and then come over here to advanced and you can put in an inner diameter. You can do a cleaning cross section, regular cross section. Even polygons. And you can also do bitmaps, which I'm not going to go into a great deal of uh, detail on simply uh, because they're infrequently used, but basically what it allows you to do is create a template, a uh, bitmap image uh, offline, and then bring it in to put it on the microscope computer, and you can actually Come down here, load in a particular file. And it will mill whatever that image is. Now, a common question is what is the difference between a cleaning cross section and a regular cross section? Uh, put simply, the regular cross section will they're, they both end at a face, but the cleaning cross section basically works from the top down so that the last bit of, of work it does is the floor of the staircase because essentially the cross section creates a staircase, whereas a cleaning cross section starts in the back and works its way forward. So the last pass of the ion beam is the very face you're interested in. So it cleans the face. That's why it's called a clean cross section. The um, reason why, you know, if you, you might wonder why bother with a clean or a regular cross section if a cleaning cross section gives you better cross section views, is that the regular cross section is actually more efficient at removing material. Uh, so most people will do the bulk removal with a regular cross section and then clean up the edges with a cleaning cross section. I'm going to delete these because I don't need all this stuff here. Now, another thing you can do here, so let's put down a rectangle, is you want to take note of what color the pattern is. Yellow means you're planning to mill, but you can also deposit using the ion beam. And how you do that is quite simple. You come over here, where it says intent, click there and it gives you the different depositions. So you can do platinum deposition, you can do carbon depth. And as I do this, notice that the color of the pattern also changes. And if you come down here, you'll notice those colors coincide under gas injection with the different types of depositions. So here it says dark green for next 
tungsten dip, and it says tungsten dip up here. If I change this to platinum deposition, it changes it to the same color as the indicator right here. Pattern is set, but we can't actually do the deposition yet. And the reason for that is because the uh, if we currently just tell it to do a pattern, the, the valve opens for the gas injection system, it's all gonna get sucked straight down to the turbo pump. We need this gas to flow across the surface of the sample so that the ions can interact with it and do the depositional process. The pattern is green. We're going to insert the GIS needle so that the gas flow will go across the sample. All right. Always a good idea to check. And yes, you'll notice that there was a contrast change in both the uh, E beam and the ion beam. That's because the GIS needle ever so slightly changes the magnetic field inside. Now, currently to do this particular pattern, to do a pattern 20 microns by 5.4 microns by one micron tall, at this beam current is gonna take four hours and 24 minutes and 21 seconds, which realistically nobody's going to wait for that long. So how you adjust this is either A, you can change the size of your pattern, all right, which did some, but now makes it so it's still going to be one hour. Or you can come over here to beam current and you can increase the beam current. Now, you may have a temptation to do, oh, you know, if I do something like 9.9 .9 nanoamps, it's going to take me 21 seconds. Uh, resist this temptation because what is happening is that that ion beam uh, comes down, interacts with the sample, creates secondaries to cause the breakdown of the gas that causes the deposition. This means that technically you are still milling at the same time you are depositing. It's just that you are depositing, or hopefully depositing, faster than you're milling. So if you choose a beam current that is too high, instead you flip it on its head, and you mill faster than you deposit. So you'll get some platinum-ish residue around things, but basically you're going to dig a hole. So as a, as a general rule, you're probably going to, for a one micron thick pattern, you should be spending somewhere in the neighborhood of like four to seven minutes doing it. Now, if you're wondering, I don't really like, you know, trying to figure this out in five to seven, I want something more uh, concrete. Well, one thing you can do is you can take the X and Y size, so the area of the pattern, multiply that by 15, and it will give you a pretty good indicator of roughly what beam current to choose. So in this case, 30 times 15 is 450. We got about seven minutes at 440. So this is probably a pretty decent value to use. Another way you can do it though, is that, and this only works for the platinum deposition, the one where it's fully spelled out, is if you come to properties, it actually down here gives you recommendation for what beam current to use. Fortunately, all the depositions are fairly equivalent when it comes to the beam current affecting the rate of deposition. So if I wanted to do a tungsten deposition, for instance, and I didn't want to, to do the calculations, I could simply tell it to do a platinum deposition intent, and then change it to a tungsten depth pattern afterwards and be pretty secure that the beam current that the platinum deposition gave me is going to be valid for the tungsten depth. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. So when I'm ready to run the pattern, if I come up here, it says start pattern and display two. Okay, so as I do that over here under remaining time, it's now counting down. And then over here in the electron beam view, it's actually doing what's called I spot. Okay, this is a very useful thing. And it's actually down here at the bottom of the patterning window. And basically what this does is that based off the time interval or line interval that you choose, it will automatically stop the patterning, take a picture, in the electron beam and then restart the patterning. So this is great for being able to view what you're doing more or less live. The downside of it is, is that it stops the pattern every single time it does this. 
So if you'll notice here, it goes down by three and then pauses for a second because it has to take that view. So if you set your time interval too small, you, the amount of time it actually takes to cr do your full pattern will be extended by a great deal. So in this case, it's simple deposition. I'm not worried about it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and increase my time interval to about like 15 seconds. And now the iSpy will only activate every 15 seconds. Now, there's no real need for me to run this pattern to completion. So I can simply come up here. If I want to pause it, I can click on this icon or I can actually uh, stop the patterning. All right, and I have my nice little brick there and you can see it also here. These are often referred to as loafs. Read it. So next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a milling pattern. So I'm going to, let's do a, uh, we'll do a regular cross section. Okay. So we set it up. Now, one of the things to be aware of when you are doing like a cross section or something and you're wanting to see the face that you're looking at is you need to be aware of the fact that the electron beam image is imaging at 52 degrees. What this means is that you have to have a distance in Y sufficient to allow you to see the bottom of your cross section. So as a general rule, you're going to want a Y size about 1.5, it's actually like 1.32 or something like that, just the tangent of 52 degrees. I round it to 1.5 times your Z. So I'm going to set this for three. I'm going to set this for 4.5. And right now it's going to take four minutes and 32 seconds to make this cut. I don't want to wait that long. So here is where you can go to higher beam currents. Now the higher problem with higher beam currents other than the fact that it limits how much you can uh, take snapshots before you start destroying the thing you're interested in, uh, is the fact that because the beam is Gaussian, you're gonna have a larger tail to it, and also your spread is larger. So you're going to tend to get worse imaging, though in this case, the imaging is particularly bad. Yeah, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a little bit of focusing. So this is always nice if you have some point where you can go. So this is the reduced area, it means only the area inside this box is gonna be updated. So I can unpause that and sharpen my image, focus and stick. All right, so now I can come back to the E-beam, move back to my point of interest. Uh, so we've moved back to the, our actual position. We're gonna take a snapshot over here. And this is why it's always a good idea before you ever run a pattern to take a snapshot. Not only because it lets you see what the quality of your focus and stig is, but it also helps make sure that you are actually positioning your pattern where you think you are. So I'm going to move this in a little bit and it's going to take 44 seconds, which is fine. So I'm going to say go. And I could just take this up higher if I wasn't willing to wait that 44 seconds, I could have taken this to 9.9 .9 nano amps uh, and it's more or less linear. So that would have taken, you know, 10, 12 seconds. So there we've done it. We've made a cross section on it. It's given us a nice face. You can do mill, you can do deposition. We've talked about iSpy. You have figured out how to use the ion beam on the Helios 5 system. When you're done, make sure to withdraw the GIS needle and you can go ahead and close down the beams. Usually the easiest thing to do is beams off. 
If you are the last user, if the next user isn't there waiting, uh, please put the system to sleep because this will allow the, the gallium source to cool so that it can increase the lifetime of the source. Okay. And then you do your usual vent and take your sample out and log out of iLab and fill out the logbook. I hope you found this tutorial useful.